Welcome to the birthday party for Jesus Christ, all right? Hey, this service is the turn up service. Y'all are ready to party and give God some celebration in the nation. We've gathered because we have a good God who loves us so much. And today we get to celebrate his birthday. Now, as I was preparing for this message, I mean, here's the thing. The, 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 the interesting thing about the gospel message is that this is the same story that we have been telling for over 2,000 years. So what's the creative lens that we get to bring and open up the word of God? And then it hit me. I think that Jesus' birthday is the only birthday party that you will go to that you get a present on his birthday. Isn't that weird? I think Jesus got a little bit gypped. But I started looking at the history of gift giving and how this started. Did you know that this act of gift giving was started to remember the greatest gift given to us? That when we receive the gift of Jesus, that our life should be so different, we should be so compulsed because we have given, been given such a great gift, we cannot help but give someone else a gift. That is how gift giving and that tradition started, not just here, but around the globe. And what we give, what we give as gifts, it communicates something, doesn't it? When we think about it, as you open up gifts tonight, or maybe tomorrow morning, or whenever you open up gifts, when we give a gift, it's because we're communicating a love for somebody. We're communicating something that we think of them when we think of this gift. Or we give a gift that we think they'll need, a value, something of worth for them. So when I was seven years old, I received the best Christmas gift that I'd ever gotten in, in my life at that moment. But I want to say it was probably my very favorite Christmas gift. It was a very simple gift from my uh, uh, uncle, but it came in a velvet box and I opened it up and it was a gold face watch with a brown leather band. But this watch was so fancy. It was the fanciest thing I'd ever seen because as the hands of the clock moved, a sun would come up during the day and a moon would come up at night. And my, I know, oh, is that so cute? I loved it. And my uncle was communicating and teaching me not just how to tell time, but the value of time. He gave me a gift that represented something to communicate his love and something that he thought that I needed. And gifts do just that. They're trying to communicate something to us. So if tomorrow you open up a present and inside is a box of Rogaine, a book on manners, and some Tic Tacs, that's communicating something, right? Exactly. So God gave us something in this gift of Jesus that he was trying to communicate to us about. Now think about it. If God thought that our greatest need, if he perceived that our greatest need was economic, he would have given us an economist. If he thought that our greatest need was humor and fun, he would have sent a comedian. If he thought our greatest need was health, he would have given us a doctor. But no, God knew that our greatest need was to be in communion with him, to be in a right relationship with him. But he knew that sin had separated us, so he sent his son as a savior. That gift communicates something. He knew what we needed. And, and God did this. God did this because as we opened up service and it was on the screen, you don't have to turn there. In a second, I'm gonna have you turn to Luke chapter two, but on the screen, he did this because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, somebody say whoever, whoever, black, white, Asian, Haitian, Eurasian, Croatian, tall, short, skinny, floofy, educated, non-educated, broken, busted, bad, and bougie, whomever <laughs> believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That is love. That is your love story the greatest love story. If you've been with us during this holiday season here at church, we've been going through a series on Advent. The wait is over. And Advent means arrival. And so what we are communicating, what we've learned in these four values that we've gone through for Advent is that the, the arrival of Jesus Christ was the greatest gift that God could have given us. And each week we took a different value. The first week was on hope and we took a look at the wise men and the hope the wise men had in following the star to find Jesus. And then peace, the peace that we have because Christ is the prince of all peace. And then last week was on joy, the joy that we have, like Mary, to, to usher in the birth of Christ. And this last week is on love. And who better to typify this than Jesus himself on his birthday? Now you might be here today and you're like, that doesn't matter. I don't care about love. I think the reason why we as a culture 
have been numb to this idea of love is because our definition of love is fickle, it's thin, and it's muddled at best. I've shared this before, but if you're new here or you're visiting, the English language is a very limited language. So you can say, I love McDonald's, I love my dog, I love my best friend, and I love my mom. Well, which one do you love more? The Greeks had an understanding of this, and so they had words that explained different types within one word in our English language. For example, this word love. In, in, in Greek language, if they said eros, this is the lusty, musty type of love. That is the passionate type of love, where we get our English word erotic. It is the passionate, desirous type of love. But if you're talking about your best friend or maybe a sibling and you love them, that's a phileo type of love. That's a brotherly love or a storge love, a love that you have between your parents or your grandparents. But then in the New Testament, a new word comes into the Greek lexicon. And that word to talk about love is not eros, it's not storge, it is agape. And this is an unconditional love that is predicated upon nothing that you can do. In fact, our English word agony comes from this word agape because it's excruciating type of love. It's a sacrificial type of love. Do you know that we are hardwired for love? Inside of every one of us, in the DNA of our soul, we are hardwired for love. Well, of course you have to say that, Bianca. We're in church. No, science says it. Maslow's hierarchy of love indicates that for humans to exist, you need love. So to make this extra clear, extra plain, for you to have the life that you've always dreamed, the life that you've always desired, you need to have love. So we search for love. We buy gifts to satiate needs that we have, or we buy gifts to give to others and hope that they love us in return. We share meals to express love. We raise a glass at dinner room tables, cheersing over memories that we had to celebrate love, and then it ends. The holidays are over. The parties are done and dusted. People leave, and you find yourself saying, where is the love? We want connection. In the DNA of our heart and our soul, we want to be seen. We want to be known. We want that kind of love. So if you came today to church, you came from some good news. I feel like Heart the Herald, Bianca is saying the words out of Luke chapter 2. I hope that you're there. If not, the verses are on the screen. But turn with me your Bible to Luke 10 because the gospel of Luke records it this way in verse 10. I bring to you good noise, good, good noise. Ah! That's the Bianca International version. <laughs> I bring to you good news that will cause great joy for all people. In its original language, it's all means all. It's everybody. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby uh, wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. What is love? It is God saying, you don't have to be separated by sin anymore. I am sending my son as a savior. That sacrifice. Look at verse 13. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God. That's what we were just doing, family. You know, it brings me so much joy. I love when you get to church on time. I really do. I love when you show up and you sit here. These are the extra holy seats, FYI. Glad that you're here. Yes. I love that. I love that. I love when you bring out your Bibles and your notebooks because not because of what I'm saying is important, but the word of God is important. I love that. But you know what I love more than anything? When we worship together. Because we are ascribing worth to who God is. If, if he's worth it, then worship. This is what the angels did. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. That is the good news. That the favor of God has come to rest upon you and you and you and you. The favor of God has come upon us. The chaos that has been our life, the Prince of Peace will quell. My God, this is the greatest gift that we could ever desire or receive. See, God knew what our heart longed for. He knew that our soul ached for acceptance. In this gift, if you've been with us in this series, you know this gift isn't just only for wealthy wise men. This gift isn't for prestigious kings like Herod. This gift isn't for holy teenagers like Mary and Joseph. No, this gift is for everyone. God wanted that no one be kept from the arrival, the advent of Jesus. So if God thought that politics were the most important thing, he would have sent us a politician if God thought our greatest need would be philosophy and questioning the meaning of life, he would have given us a philosopher. But God knew our greatest need was to be in connection with him. So he sent his son Jesus as our savior. Now, and we, you should be in Luke 2. Just jump up a few verses to verse 8. 
So in Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, it's the birth of Jesus. Mary birthed Jesus. And then we pick this up in verse 8. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock by night. I'm going to give us one more perspective from a different group in the nativity story because I think that their story bears repeating today on a day that we highlight the love of Christ. Now, by a show of hands, how many are familiar with the nativity story? You've heard this story before that in the field, there are shepherds laying by their flocks at night. Great. A lot of us, a huge majority of us. But the problem with hearing this story repeatedly is that we can become anesthetized. We could be numb. It's like Nova came for our heart. We hear it. Yeah, 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 shepherds. Yeah, 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 at night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Heart the herald. Okay, heard it before. So what I want us to do is I don't want us to gloss over and become numb. I want us to dive into the pages. In fact, I want you, humor me on this Christmas Eve, I want you to put yourself into the shoes, the sandals of the shepherds. I want you to feel the coolness of the night. I want you to feel the dank moisture in the air. I want you to look up and see the bruised and beaten dark blue sky with a few flecks of stars in the distance. I want you to hear the bleating and the bleeding, the, 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 the buying of the sheep that you tend and take care of. See you, dear shepherd, this is what you know. This is what you have done since the day that you can work. As you lay down on the pasture of grass with your sheep sleeping in the distance, you put your hands behind your head and you say, another day, another dollar. But all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a blast of light comes through and all of a sudden you're seeing things you've never seen before. You're hearing things you've never heard before. You can't explain this. Now, dear shepherd, pick up your story in verse nine. An angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they freaked out. I mean, our version says terrified, but like who says that word, terrified? They lost their ever loving mind, okay? Because in this moment, a, dar a voice pierces the darkness, a light is shines, and in verse 10, the angel says, do not freak out. Don't be afraid. I have come to bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. The angel is saying, I have words that will change your life. The sadness, the emptiness, the mundane life that you've been living, it's all about to change because the greatest gift that your soul may not even have the language to articulate that it needs has arrived today in a town called Bethlehem. Today, verse 11, in a town of David, a savior has been born to you, to you to you, and this is a sign to you, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The Prince of Peace has come to bring peace into the chaos of your life. Now, again, put yourself in the sandal of the shepherd. How would you feel if you got this divine oracle, this word from God that his savior was sent to you? I mean, you guys came with your very polite church faces, thank you. Orange County golf clap type of faces. Oh, yes, he came for me. No, this would have been freaking crazy, okay? And if that wasn't enough, this would have been terrifying and confusing for you. But for the shepherds, it would have been absolutely insane. Out of everyone, you're going to appear to a shepherd? The shepherd would have been confused. Why would a shepherd have been confused? Well, a shepherd was a day laborer. It's not a common vocation that we know, so I'm gonna put some language to help us understand why this would have been so jaw-dropping at the time. They were day laborers. Think of it as pickers or long distance truckers. These are people that are working and mobile, nomadic. Nobody cares about them. I mean, do you know the name of the person standing at the edge of the freeway selling oranges? No, these Shepherds were a ragtag, motley crew of laborers, and they were shook. I mean, think about it. Did anyone know their name? Do you know the name of these people? No. Do you know the name John, Sean, or Carlos? Now, though you, those names might sound familiar, the names that I am referring are the names of inmates from across the nation who've written in and are part of our online and digital community, who have written in and said that the messages from the Father's House Orange County have impacted their lives and they're grateful for you, for seeing the need of shepherds of our everyday. One of these letters is from a man by the name of Mike. Mike is serving life 
for murder. And Mike had said that though his life will be spent for the rest of his life behind bars, after listening to messages from TFH, he knows that God is not done with his life. That is a love story. And it's a love story that you can have as well. The gospel isn't for a certain type of person. The gospel is for everybody. Now for us to understand the, the, the craziness of, of, of this revelation coming to shepherds, first for the note takers, the shepherds were religious outcasts. They weren't allowed to come and worship at the temple or come into like a church like this. Why? Because they were around animals 24 seven, meaning that they were ceremoniously unclean. They couldn't enter into the temple, they couldn't worship, which meant that they're missing high holidays, they're missing weekly gatherings, that people would have thought them less than because they missed out on church. You know, there's a lot of people that join us, our online digital family, who can't physically come into the building. That doesn't mean that they're less than. And during this time, people would have been looked down upon for not being in a spiritual community. The second thing we know about shepherds is that they were borderline social outcasts. So they were religious outcasts, but they were also social outcasts. Why is that? Well, they were nomadic. They were always moving to find the best pasture to feed their sheep. So they didn't have a localized sense of community. Think of them like traveling gypsies or carnival workers. They went from town to town and they were always viewed, shepherds were viewed suspiciously. They were low class even though they had money. Now of all the people in the world that God Almighty can come and give this gospel message to, he revealed himself to the shepherds and invited them and only them. King Herod didn't get an invite. The wise men came almost two years later. Who got the invite? Who was first to the party? The shepherds. And why did God send this invite to the shepherds first? The Bible is silent as to why. But could it be that God sent his greatest gift to people considered less than so that we would always have a reminder that there was a seat at the table for us too? That God does not respect kings and princes more than he does day laborers. That he doesn't respect pastors and priests more than people in the pews. That God does not show favoritism. That God does not have favor preferential treatment to one group over another. That his love is all, for all of us, every single one of us. That God's extreme love wasn't for the politically astute. No, God wasn't gonna be the savior for the, for the prominent and prestigious and the political. He was going to be our king. And this tells us that God's love doesn't discriminate based on in, intelligence or education or wealth or profession or political power or social influence or social media following or any other qualities that we judge by. God's love is offered indiscriminately because he loves you. So Jesus comes into our complex jacked up world as both royal and rustic. That a kid born in a manger would be a reigning king. That a kid born out of wedlock would be a redeemer of all things. That the kid born in Bethlehem, which means house of bread, would be the bread of life. This is poetic. This is poetic. He came into the world regardless of our sin, our stature, or our shame. Why? Because God's love is unlike any other conditional love. It is an agape love. A love that loves regardless of your circumstances. His love is available to the wise men and also to the shepherd, but you have to receive it. You have to receive his love and allow his love to transform you. Because the truth of the matter is, is many of us will come on a holiday like Christmas and we're like, okay, amazing, great, I got Jesus, I got his love. And if you leave and never do anything with it, it's nothing more than a high or a hit from a drug where you go high and you come low. But if you allow yourself to receive this gift of love and allow the love of God to transform your life, your life will look different. Your words will be different. Your thoughts will be different. Your patterns will be different. Your relationships will be different. But you got to let the love of God transform you. Look at the response of the shepherds in verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Hey, yo, bro, this is crazy. Let's go. I mean, how do you read your Bible? Let us thou go forth to Bethlehem. No, they are tripping out. Bro, if this is real, let's go see this thing that we heard and which Christ told us about. So listen, know what they did. Know what they did. They heard it and they acted upon it. Today, you're going to hear the word of God. And I pray that your 2024 looks different because you applied it to your life. This is not just coming in for a holy high. It's us coming in and being radically transformed by a good God who loves you and wants you to thrive. Verse 16, 
So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning about what they had been told to them about this child. And all who heard about it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard, uh, which were just as they had been told. The gift of God's great love given to us through Jesus is the story that the shepherds told that day. It's the story that I tell you today. That behold, hark the herald, angels will sing glory to this newborn king. This is your love story. This is Advent, the arrival of Jesus coming to earth. You don't have to be a social outcast like a shepherd. You have the good news. You don't have to be searching like the wise men. You've got the good news. You don't have to allow your sin to separate you from a nature of a God who loves you just as you are, but loves you too much to let you stay there. This is the good news. You have to receive this gift, accept this gift, apply this gift, and your life will be transformed. Have you ever been around those people that are awkward around receiving big gifts? It's the truth. Just watch. Just trust me. Whether you open up your gifts tonight or tomorrow morning, you always have one member in your family that, like, they deserve an Emmy. Oh, <gasps> me? Oh, my gosh. This, oh, no. No, this is too much. I can't. I can't. It's a box of socks, bro. Like, really? <laughs> those people are interesting. You know what they're communicating when they reject this gift? They're either saying, you can't afford this or I don't deserve this. That's what we're saying when we reject gifts. And that's a lot of people's same response when it comes to receiving the love of God that has been offered to us by Christ Jesus. God's love that has been offered to us by Christ Jesus. This is what it says in 1 John 4, 9. Don't turn there, it's on the screen. That God has shown his love to you and to me, to us, by sending his only son into the world. God did this so that we might have life through Christ. The arrival and the birth of Jesus announces what every soul in here craves. Whether you realize it or not, whether you find yourself saying, I don't need love, or love has let me down, or maybe you find yourself saying, I have a great marriage. I, I, I love my spouse. We don't argue. We don't wake up with morning breath. We never fight about finances. Our kids are perfect. They don't smell. They never talk back. And you've experienced a great love. Good. <laughs> Maybe you have amazing parents. You were never spanked, and that's why you don't have friends today. If no one's told you, that's, that's why. But maybe you have a really good best friend, and you've experienced really good, healthy love relationships. What I can guarantee you in all those relationships is that as amazing as they are, they've let you down in some way, shape, or reason. Because it's human. But there is a love unlike any other, a divine love. The love of Jesus is an unfailing love. It is a preserving love. It's a love that will find you and search you out. It is a love that places value on you when you can't place value on you. It is the love that forgives you and sees you. It is the only love that can satisfy you because it is his love that you were designed for, but you have to receive his love. And then let your life be transformed by the renewing love of God. And there's people online and the video experience in this room, when they hear about the love of God, they fight it. And they say, no, no, no. God can't love me. Oh, me? No. It's too much. You don't know what I've done. No, no, he, he can't. And you know what you're saying? You're saying either God cannot afford it or you are unworthy of it. But here's the good news. God's love was never predicated by anything that you have done. His love is a free gift for you. It is a sacrificing, anguishing, agape kind of love. What happens when we choose to reject this gift from God? It's simple. If you reject this gift from God, this gift of love, you will spend the rest of your life searching for someone or something to give you what only God can give you. That is his redeeming love. If God thought that you needed food, he would have sent you a chef. If God felt that your need was money, he would have made you wealthy. But God knew that your greatest need would be a relationship with the Savior who sees you, who knows you, who could call purpose and fashion you for a destiny that you can't even begin to think. That is the love of God. No longer do we have to stay in the doldrums of our average, basic, and boring life. 
There is a life, an eternal life that is destined to us, but there's an earthly life that has been promised to us because we have a God who loves us and wants to restore things on heaven and on earth. And God loved you so much that he didn't just send his son to be born for you. He sent his son to be born for you so that he could die for you. That is the anguishing agape love. You came here today and yes, we have Santa Claus in photo booths and yes, we have a cookie decorating station and hot cocoa, but you didn't come for any of that. Yes, you look great in your three-piece suit and your high heels, but you didn't come for a fashion show. Yes, you came and we made it snow here in Orange County, but you didn't come for that. You came to hear that there's a God who sees you, who knows you, who knows every hair on your head and every tear that you've shed. He knows your sin. He knows your secrets. He knows your shame. He knows your fear. He knows your anxiety. He knows your depression. He knows your longings. He knows your achings. He sees you and he's saying, come to me. I love you I love you and maybe you thought that you were coming today to take off a religious obligation off of a moral box what you need to hear and what I pray to God that you remember and the loneliness and the ache of wherever you're at in life that there's a God who loves you and maybe today is the first time that you are hearing this message whether in the video experience here in this room or watching with our online global family but you were hearing this for the first time and you were thinking, that's what I want. That's what my soul longs for. If that is you and you've never said yes to Jesus, or maybe, maybe at one point you were walking with the Lord, you were walking lock and step with God, but you've turned your back on God. The word in the Bible that is used is called repent. That means make a U-turn to receive this love of God yet again. Church family, will you do me a favor to create a sacred space? Can you bow your head? Can you close your eyes? Because today I'm gonna to give an invitation. On the count of three, I'm gonna invite you to boldly raise up your hand, not only so I can see it, but, but that, that God could see it as well. This is your declaration to the world and to God saying, I want to receive the love of God and have his love transform my life. But if that is you in here, one, by raising your hand, you are saying, I want Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of my life. That two, by raising your hand, you are saying that my mistakes and my failure, what the Bible refers to as sin, could be forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross. And three, by raising your hand, you are claiming the same power that resurrected Jesus from the grave will live in me. If that is you, boldly and brazenly on the count of three. One, two, three. Will you raise your hand? God bless you. 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 Happy birthday, Jesus. Happy birthday to your spiritual life. There's a God who loves you. Anyone else before we go? Your heart is pounding and you're like, I don't want to be thirsty. I don't want to feel weird. It's weird. This is weird. Welcome to the weird. There's a God who sees you. That's weird. There's a God who wants to restore you. That's a trip. So dear shepherd, is there anyone else before we go? Is there anyone else? God bless you for raising your hand. We wait for the one, baby. Yeah, we do. Oh, we celebrate with those stepping into a right relationship with God, to let those who raise their hand know that this decision is not an isolation, you're not alone. We are gonna pray together as a church family. Church, will you bow your head and repeat after me? Can we say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today I choose you as my Lord and Savior. Cleanse my hands, cleanse my heart, cleanse my head. Fill me with your spirit to do what I cannot do. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And the church says, amen.